Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful th Sabbath day. Thank you for bringing us together today. And may we praise your name and glory. May we learn that your earth and your creation is all done by your hands. None of it is done by us. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. Never done this before, but hey, why not? <laughs> First time for everything. Yep. Yeah. First, um, I don't know how curious you guys are, but when I was a kid, I used to play with whatever was available. So one day I decided, my dad held all these glass and mason jars outside, and they were just laying there. So I grabbed all the jars, and I filled them with all different kinds of dirt. Turned on the hose in the back, filled them all with water. Put all the covers on, and then I'd shake them up. And I'd just watch all the settlement come down in different layers. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I was about 10. I loved science. So I was like, well, that's kind of cool. Well, in the Bible, in Genesis 7, at the end of chapter 11 and, cha and verse 11 and 12, it says, the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. During that time, we were all in that little jar, being shaken up and stirred. Have any of you ever been out to the, a river or a lake right after it rained, downpoured? What does the water look like? Anybody, just speak up. Uh, muddy, and muddy, dirty, nasty, just gross looking. You wouldn't want to swim in that. So, as the next days go by, all that mud settles to the bottom, just like that jar. Well, the same thing happened with the flood. All that settlement settled down onto the earth. But during that time when it's muddy, all those little plankton and little things that are floating, trying to, uh, trying to get sunlight to live, trying to eat other little animals that they can come across, little tiny things, they don't get sunlight, they don't get food. So what happens is they die. And as they die, they leave their little skeletons behind. And when they do that, they make chalk. Now, this layer of chalk forms all around the earth. It is the only layer that is universal. It is called the Cambrian layer. In that, now some areas might be a little thicker, some are a little thinner. And in that layer, you find it all over the, the world. So, whenever you see chalk, or you're playing with chalk, you can think, God made this. Amen. 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 Without God, I have no chalk. Amen. That is all. Thank you. I'm going to turn my hearing aid off so that I... Nope, it's not off yet. I don't talk loud enough when it's on. Hold on. Somebody say something. Yes. All right. It's up. Am I talking louder now? Yes. All right. Before I begin, let's just bow our heads for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. I want to tell you a couple of stories to start out with, and if you heard them, please forgive me. But there's some here who didn't hear them. Uh, there are times that people say, well, how do you really know 
that there is a God. And like the gentleman who told the children's story, I look at science and stuff and that, but something happened that every time they asked me that question, in fact, I told this story to an atheist one time. And when I got done telling this story, he said, did that really happen? I said, it really happened? I can take you back and I can show you the place where it happened to me. Six months later, he was baptized. Amen. So now I'm going to tell you the story. Uh, this dear lady that sang up here with me, we had just gotten married. We were on that vacation that newly was take called the honeymoon. And we had been driving that afternoon about five hours. It was about nine o'clock at night and we only had about ten miles to go to get where we were staying. And if you know anything about honeymooners, they don't like to be seeing other people. They just want to see each other. And we're driving down the highway and all of a sudden, just as plain as day, a voice in my head said, I want you to turn left at the next intersection. I thought, I don't want to do that. I don't know anybody down there. I'm on my honeymoon. And I went to the intersection. I went on by. And after I went on by, very strong in my mind, I really wanted you to go down that road. So I looked over at my bride and I said, did you hear anything? She said, no, why? I said, well, I just had a strong impression that we should have turned and gone down that road. And she's braver than I. I didn't want her to know I was a coward at the time. She said, well, let's go see what's down there. So we turned the car around and went down, went down that road. And uh, we drove back about a mile back into the countryside. And it was a dirt road. This is in Nebraska. Anybody ever flown in an airplane over eastern Nebraska? If you look down, it looks like a big checkerboard because it's flat. And back in the 1860s, they had what they called the Homestead Act. And anybody could go out and survive on 160 acres for five years, it was yours. Mm -hmm. And each section has 160 acres, four of them. And when you fly over, they marked it off, it's a square mile. And as you're driving down the highway, you can check your speedometer because it's right on, right to the mile. We had passed 200 of these roads. A little voice said, go down this one. So we drove back there, and we came to this big, beautiful looking farm in a farmhouse. And I thought, well, you know, if it had been a poor house, I wouldn't have been so afraid. But like I said, I didn't want my bride to realize what a coward I was. So we turned into the yard, and by this time it was already getting dark. We stopped the car. We went up on the front porch and rang the doorbell. A man came to the door, and he was a little bit grumpy because it's 9 o'clock at night. And he says, what do you want? And I said something about being Christians and calling on people. And he said some bad words and told us to get off his farm. <laughs> and I felt like a fool. And we turned around and started down the steps. When we heard a teenage girl's voice say, Daddy, I'd like to hear what they have to say. And he said, well, I guess you can't want to. So he went back in the living room to watch the TV. And we followed her to the dining room and sat at the table. And we talked about Jesus. We didn't stay too long. But uh, I asked her if she would like to get three Bible lessons in the mail. Free. Did I say free or three? I meant free. And uh, I had a card with me. I had her fill the card out. This is all mail when I get to town. And I also had a little book called Steps to Christ. That's how many have read Steps to Christ? It really is an encouraging book. Anyway, I gave her that book and then I asked her to be all right if we pray for her. And she said, well, I think that'd be all right. So we had prayer for her. And then we got up, we headed toward the door. And as we were going toward the door, this teenage girl said, it sure is funny that you came to our house tonight. And I says, why do you say that? She says, well, I'm taking summer school. And just this afternoon, I was sitting in biology class in summer school. And the teacher was saying that the Bible is just all fairy tales, that uh, evolution is the way that things really came into existence. And he said, uh, only weak-minded people believe the Bible and Christianity. And she said, while the teacher was saying that, she said, I don't know whether there's a God or not. We don't go to church. And I can tell by the way her dad talked that they probably didn't. But she said, while the teacher was saying that, she says, I looked up at the ceiling. And, I, and she said, God, if you're really up there, send somebody to tell me about you before I go to bed tonight. She said, I was just getting ready to go to bed when you guys rang the doorbell. So I says, well, we just got married. We're in our honeymoon. We didn't plan on stopping seeing anybody. And I says, we have driven 200 miles. And when we came to your road, a voice, the same God you were talked to in Bible, in biology class, told me to turn down your road. I says, I've never been here. I haven't anything. But I know that there's a God. Amen. 
And it makes me think of the song that we sometimes sing that says he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I'm his own. And the only thing about that story that bothers me is how many times has God tried to speak to me and I wasn't paying attention? How many recognize that Satan is all the time trying to keep us off God's wavelength so that when God speaks to us, we're not paying attention? How many understand what I'm saying? Amen. I remember reading a story on, the, on my computer and it was about back in the days when the cutting edge of communication was uh, a wire in de 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 Morse code. Anybody know Morse code? Oh, okay, well I don't know Morse code. But anyway, they had just set up a someplace out west, uh, an office, and they had the lines come through, and they needed. They decided they would keep it open all night long, and they needed one person to sit at the uh, at the da, da, whatever they call it there, and so they put an advertisement out. And the next morning, about five young men showed up, at, and there was a note on the door, and it said, "If you're here applying for the Morse code job." Come on in and have a seat. We will call for you. So they went in and sat down and uh, waited and waited. They could hear the, the uh, Morse code going off into the room. They weren't paying attention. And they sat there for an hour. Nothing happened. About 9 o'clock, another young man came in, read the note, sat down. But he only sat down for about three minutes. And then he got up and he walked across the room to the door that said manager's office. And he opened the door without even knocking and walked in. And those guys that had been waiting there all that time thought, who does he think he is? Nobody called for him. And uh, he was only in there a couple of minutes, and he came out, and the manager came out with him. And he saw those five fellows sitting there, and he said, did you guys come to interview for the Morris College? Oh, yeah, we did. Well, he says, I only needed one, and I've hired this guy. Wait a minute, one of them said. He just showed up. We've been waiting an hour, and he never called on us. And the man said, can you hear the, the telegraph going off in the back? Yeah. Well, if you'd been paying attention, it was sending out a message. Whoever gets this message, the first one to come in the office gets the job. This guy was paying attention. And, he worked. and sometimes, how many figured that out already before I finished the story? I thought you had. I believe in the judgment. The whole judgment is going to be based on one thing. Were you paying attention? Because I think of the text in the Bible that says, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And you and I are living in a world that there are so many other voices, there's so many other things that keep our attention off of God. And I see the most important reason for reading the Bible, the most important reason for praying, and the most important reason for coming to church is to get your brain tuned in on God's wavelength. Amen. So when the Holy Spirit wants to say something, you can hear Him. And I'll tell you again, the thing that bothers me about myself more than anything else is all the times that I let my mind wander on other things. Now I want you to look at a text. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. There we go. And look down, if you're in your Bible, look down to verse... Four. And I'm going to read verse 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity, what? Every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now we know in the Bible it talks about it's important to be obedient to God. And we struggle sometimes with that, but then we get to reading in Matthew chapter 5, and we recognize that Jesus is not just talking about behavior in the actions that you do. But before you get done with chapter 5, he's talking about the importance of what you think. And Matthew chapter 5 is the place where it says, that if a man looks on a woman and lusts after her, he's already committed adultery with him, with her in his heart. And I think it's hard enough to control my actions. Lord, do you want me to control my thoughts too? How many recognize that he does? And I'm going to preach a sermon today that I have found out 
that if you do it, there is a way to control your thoughts. Now, years ago, they made a movie, and it wasn't a religious movie, but there was a song in that movie. You may have heard it. And in the song it says, when the dog bites, when the bee stings, when I'm cold and sad, then I remember my favorite things and I don't feel so bad. And God has given us the most wonderful favorite things that we can think of if we'll just think about it. Now, I want you to go to the text that Aaron read to you. It's found in the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 10. And I want to give you a little background on Luke chapter 10. What you find here in Luke chapter 10 is not only did Jesus have his 12 disciples, but what you have in Luke chapter 10 is that there were 70 who were following Jesus. And when you start in Luke chapter 10, he gave a commission to the 70 to go out and let them know the Messiah is coming. And when you get down to verse 17, it says, And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in your name. How many like that? I have seen a shirt t-shirt that says, the devil made me do it. But there's something about the word of God that you can make the devil put on a t-shirt and the t-shirt would say, the young Christian made me do this. Because what it says here in Luke chapter 10 verse 17, they came back, they were all excited, and they said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in your name. How many like that? How many like the idea that Jesus is going to give you power to start pushing Satan around? Now, how many of you would like to know how to make Satan leave you alone? How many of you would like to know how to make Satan leave you alone? Well, I'm because I know how to make Satan leave you alone. Are you ready? You cooperate with him. You do what he wants you to do. He won't bother you anymore. Am I telling you the truth? Because you look at, at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what the devil wanted them to do was break the commandments. says, don't bow down to an image. And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. Say one did, and they got thrown into a fiery furnace. And you, you, you know the story of Daniel. Satan wanted Daniel to stop praying to God. Daniel wouldn't do it. So what happened to Daniel? Because he wouldn't stop praying to God? He got thrown into the lion's den. And I go back and I look at the story of Job. And all that Satan wanted Job to do was curse God. And Job wouldn't do it. And because Job would not cooperate with Satan, Satan gave him all kinds of troubles. Am I right? Yes. Now another question I asked. How many would like to know how to make Satan mad at you? And you think, oh, oh, no. Hey, I think you do want to, if you're a Christian, you want to make Satan mad at you. I want to live in such a way that Satan hates me. How many think Satan hated Job? And he couldn't get Job to do what he wanted to do, and he gave him all kinds of trouble. Now, how many want... Satan to leave you alone. Amen. Not really. Am I right? Because if you are doing God's will, He's coming after you. So, when you look at this text, there is something here in Luke 17 that when Satan comes to bother you and Satan comes after you, look at verse 17 again. And the 70 returned again with what? Joy. Saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in your name. There is a way to resist Satan. And we know the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so that's a way to make him leave you alone. Don't bother him, he'll bother you. And remember the story when Jesus went out into the wilderness right after he was baptized and Satan came to tempt him and he gave him three temptations. And I won't go through all those, that's not the sermon today. But after Jesus had resisted him on all three. And by the way, do you know how Jesus resisted Satan? It is written. If you want to resist Satan, have God's word in your mind. And what it says there is after that, that Satan left him for a time, waiting for a more convenient time. So when you resist the devil, he will flee from you, but he's going to hang around, and in a more convenient time, he's going to come back. How many know that that's true? And how many recognize that it is a good sign for Satan to bother you because he's after you. Am I right? So, let's look at verse 17 again. The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in thy name. 
Now, there are other texts that talk about this. Remember in Genesis 3.15, you probably know that one. That's when it said that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head and the process would get its heel bruised. Remember that? Well, there's a text that sounds like that in Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. And if you want to look at that one, what it says as you get into Romans 16, 20, it's talking to God's people and it says, God is going to crush Satan under your feet. Now, God is going to kick Satan in the head, right? Jesus did on Calvary. But He's doing it, going to do it again. And let me ask you a question. Have you ever prayed, Lord, if you want to kick Satan in the head, can I be your foot? Because that's what it says in Romans 16, 20. God is going to crush Satan where? Under your feet. And there's another text that talks about this. Go back to the Psalms. And you're acquainted with Psalms 90, the one that says that he that dwelleth in the secret place the Most High. How many want to dwell in the secret place the Most High? And look what happens when you're dwelling in the secret place the Most High. You get down to verse 13 in Psalms 91, and look at what it says. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Who's that old serpent? Satan, right? He's the lion. Goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom may devour. But it says here in Psalms 91, you're going, to, you're going to trip on, step on them. Now go back to Luke 10. I think we can pretty much stay in Luke 10 now. Uh, well, I'll go a few other places. But I want to read some more. In verse 18, And he said unto them, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now we often use this text in the context of when he was kicked out. He rebelled against God. He was kicked down as a... And it's all right to use this text in that way. But I want you to notice the context here. It's not talking about when he was kicked out of heaven. This is talking about right then when God had 70 common ordinary people whose names we do not know going out in Jesus' name and Satan gets cast down again. Can you see that? So let me read verse 18 again. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. What's the context here? It's a bunch of common, ordinary people just like you and I going out in Jesus' name and Satan is getting cast down again. How many like to be one of those people that God uses to throw Satan down? Amen. Now, let's go to verse 19. Look what it says. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Uh, I've already said, well, you know who's the serpent is, that's Satan, Right? And I think the scorpions are his evil angels. That sound pretty good? They have a sting in them. But notice what it says. I'm going to give you power to tread on them. And this idea of treading on the enemy is uh, the way they did battle. Because back in those days, they didn't have airplanes. They didn't have guns. And the, the close, you had to get close enough to either sling a rock at them or, or shoot an arrow or throw a spear. But in battles in those days, when the battle was over, the loser was on the ground and the winner was stepping over them. Are you with me? And so what Jesus is saying here in Luke 10, 19, I'm going to give you power and you're going to go to battle with Satan and his evil angels and when you're done with them, they're going to be on the ground and you're going to be standing on their neck. How many like that idea? Amen. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you power. And then you look at the last phrase of verse 19 and it says, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now the hurt that it's talking about here, I do not believe, is physical hurt. Stephen was stoned. Jesus was crucified. All the disciples were beaten. Hurt physically, yes. So the kind of hurt that it's talking about here is the real kind of hurt. And that's the damage that Satan gets you to do to yourself when you disobey God. And notice what it says here. I'm going to give you power over all the power that I make and he won't be able to hurt you. How many like that? Amen. Now, how many want to know how to take hold of that power? Because sometimes, you know, we pray and we say, Lord, give me strength. Give me, anybody ever do that? Lord, give me strength. Sometimes you get it. Sometimes, have you ever done it and you didn't get the strength? <laughs> All right. This is going to tell you how to get the strength. And here it is. Notice verse 20. Notwithstanding in this. Rejoice not 
that the spirits are subject unto two. And I remember the first time I preached this sermon, and I read this part, don't rejoice for the spirits are subject unto you. How many think that's a little bit strange? Satan tempts you, and you don't do it. How many like that? And when you get done, you feel kind of good about yourself. I made a New Year's resolution, and I kept it. And when we are tempted, and we don't overcome, we feel good. I didn't overcome, but notice what Jesus said here. Don't rejoice when Satan is subject to you. How come Jesus said that? Well, it's like the Pharisee in Luke 18, just a few verses from this. Remember, there were two people who came up to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee was rejoicing over the things that he didn't do. I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. And not only do I not do those things, but I do these things. Was he rejoicing over the fact that he thought he was doing pretty good? Am I right? And when you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, it's talked about the seven churches. You get down near the end of Revelation, chapter 3, and it's talked about the Laodicean church. And they are rejoicing. I'm rich and increased with good and have need of nothing. And the Bible says, you're miserable, poor, blind, and dumb and naked. So what Jesus is saying here, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 20, when you get victory over Satan, don't rejoice about that. How many think I'm a little strange? Don't rejoice when you get victory over Satan. Why? Because then you fall in the same trap of the Pharisee did in Luke chapter 18. And here's what I think Satan does. He, how many recognize he's sneaky? Yeah. So you're resisting him. What does he do when you resist him? He congratulates you. You're really doing pretty good here. And while you're looking at your own righteousness, you've taken your eyes off Jesus. He sneaks around and gets you with a really big one. And one of our favorite writers says the most despicable sin in the sight of God is self-righteousness. We look at ourselves and we think we're doing pretty good. And we are in big, big danger when we do that. Because the other fellow that came to the temple to pray in Luke 18, all he could think of was to say was, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, That man went home justified. When I was here 20 years ago, did I explain to you what the word justified means? I see Justin shaking his head. Can you tell people what justified means, Justin? Just if I never sinned. Whoa. Now see, I don't have my hair nails, but I think I read his lips. I think he said, just as if I'd never sinned. Is that right? That's what justified means. And that comes from the book Steps to Christ. And let me give you a quote. I love this quote. It says this. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, then no matter how sinful your past life may have been, for Christ's sake, you are accounted righteous. Because Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as though you had never sinned. So here's this, this publican. Goes up the temple. All I can think of and say is, God have mercy me a sinner. Jesus says that man went home just as though he had never sinned. How many can think of anything better to rejoice about? Amen. Now, notice here, the last part of verse 20. I'm going to read verse 20 again. Notwithstanding in this, Rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. Now I want you to think about it a minute. When was this, when was Luke 10, what part of Jesus' ministry? I'm not sure exactly, but I know one thing for certain, is that it wasn't on the day of crucifixion. It wasn't on the Last Supper. What right did these disciples have to rejoice their name was in the book. What had they done that got the name written in the book? And I'm, the way Satan makes us think is, well, when you've overcome and you're really getting pretty good, then maybe your name can be written in the book. And I don't know if you've noticed it, but in our old hymnal was a song called, Is My Name Written There? How many remember that? And it kind of gives you the idea, you know, is my name written there? No, right? But you'll discover... They didn't put it in the new hymnal. Do you know why they didn't put it in the new hymnal? Because Jesus says here in Luke chapter 10 and verse 20, I want you to rejoice that your name is written there. So question, how do the disciples get their name written in the book? Because when you look at the disciples, you know, sometime later, well, 
you know, as they were traveling along, they'd get bickering about who's going to be the highest in the kingdom. I remember that. And right at the last, the day before the Last Supper, the mother of James and John came to Jesus on the sly and said, when you set up your kingdom, can my sons sit closest on the highest? And the other king disciples found out about it, and they were all mad. And they came to the Last Supper griping and complaining about the mother of James. How many are with me? Now, how many recognize this sin, wanting the highest place, is probably just about as close to the original sin as you're going to get because this was the problem that Satan had. He wanted the highest place. And here's these disciples, these followers of Jesus, and they're wanting the highest place. So how in the world did they get their name written in the book? If you go to the book Desire of Ages, page 331, there is a chapter there called The Invitation. And on that page, 331, it says, When you accept Jesus' invitation... Come learn of me. In thus coming, you begin the life eternal. So here's Jesus in Luke 10 with all their bickering still in front of them. And he's telling them to rejoice their name is in the book. On what basis can you rejoice your name is in the book? Not because you've overcome everything, but because Jesus has given an invitation. Come follow me. And when you start following Jesus, you begin the life eternal. And I'm convinced that had the disciples been doing what Jesus told them to do here in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, had they been rejoicing in the name of the book, they probably wouldn't have been bickering with each other. Are you with me? How many got a bulletin? If you didn't get a bulletin, you get one before you leave. Because I want you to look at this quote on the back. On the back, uh, Aaron read it. I'm going to read it again. God desires us to serve Him in newness of life with gladness. How often? Every day. Every day. He longs. Do you know what the word long is? That's in, in bold right there. You know what the word long means? You want something. And you want it so bad. How many knew my wife for 25 years was a church school teacher? And there were some summers that she had to go away to school. How many know that teachers have to take summer school? And one summer, she could only get the classes she wanted in uh, California, Loma Linda University. We were living in Madison at the time. And it was 10 weeks, and the switchboard wasn't working very good. I had a hard time getting there. I missed her so bad. You know what I would do? I went into the closet, and I got her clothes out, and I hung them all around the apartment. That was the closest I could get her. How many can see I'm longing for her to come home? Are you right? Now notice what it says here. God longs for something. That means he wants it. He craves it. He's wishing he could get it. He longs to see gratitude welling up in our hearts because our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Are you going to give God what he wants? Now I don't know if you've noticed the title of the sermon, Perpetual Gratitude. And I'm going to take a little bit longer this because I want to tell you a story about gratitude. Anybody know what gratitude is? Say the word with me. Gratitude. Say it again. Gratitude. gratitude. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to tell you this story. I feel a little foolish telling this story. But I was, before I came here, so I may have told you this story. But I was on my way home. I'd been to a pastor's meeting. I was driving down the interstate. I looked down and I could see that my gas gauge was way over to the left side and I knew I had to get gas pretty soon. But those of you who know me know that uh, I'm kind of a penny pincher. And I knew that if I bought gas on the interstate gas station, it would cost three or four cents a gallon more than... And I knew the next exit I had to get up and, and take a, a back road. And I knew there's a little town up there about seven miles. I think, I can make it to that town. And then I'll get gas and I'll save myself maybe 25, 30 cents. I don't know. But I made it. And I pulled into the first gas station, and uh, this was back in the days when credit cards were just starting to come in, and they didn't have a sign out. And so I thought, and I didn't have any cash with me. I don't like carrying cash because I have a weakness for ice cream, but I won't put ice cream on a credit card. All right? Do things to make yourself strong. So I didn't have any cash, but I did have a credit card, and they didn't have a sign out to take my credit card. So before I pumped the gas, I went in, I said, do you take these, this credit card? He says, no, we only take cash or local checks. And I, like I said, I had no cash. I wasn't local. And I said, well, I'm about out of gas. Is there any other gas station? He says, yeah, you go on through town. 
go down the hill, cross the bridge, and halfway up the other side, another gas station. He'll probably take your credit card. So I got in my car, and I headed for the gas station, and I ran out of gas. <laughs> but uh, I coasted a little bit, and I pulled into a parking spot, and got out, and I walked on down the hill, across the bridge, up the, and uh, I told the guy my sorry story, and I says, do you take this credit card? He says, no, we don't take credit cards. They're only cash or local checks. And I told him my sad story. I said, he said, well, I said, is there any other gas station? So I told him about the one I'd already been to. I said, I've been there. They don't take it either. I said, is there anything else? He says, well, they're building a new gas station about a mile north of town. There's an intersection out there. And uh, they'll probably take your credit card. So I walked the mile out there. This was March, northern Illinois. And a little bit cold, but I got out there, and guess what? It was a new gas station. It was so new, it wasn't open yet. <laughs> so then I remembered, I'm parked in front of a bank. I'll go back and take my credit card. They'll charge me big factors so I go in there and get cash. How many have heard of bankers' hours? By the time I got back, the bank was closed, and they hadn't invented, what do they call it, ATMs. They hadn't invented those things yet. And I thought, I'm really stuck. I can't get any cash. But I noticed down a side street, there was a little sporting goods store. And they had a sign up, they'd take my credit card. And I thought, well, they don't sell gas, but I'll go in and buy something and then give it back. So I went in and I told him my sad story. And I said, can I buy anything on my credit card, then decide I don't want it, and then you give me cash back so I can get some gas to go home? Not a chance, he said. <laughs> so I went back to my car. And I'm going to talk, how many remember pay phones? These little phone booths, those are antiques now because the cell phone did those out of business. But I was parked by one of those. And I thought, well, I will call my wife, which worried me a little bit. My wife is a really wonderful person, but she has one weakness. Her sense of direction is terrible. And I thought, if I call her and she comes to bring me some money so I can get some gas, she's going to get lost. I might never see her again. <laughs> well, I had no other choice. But I knew she wasn't home, and I knew where she was working. And I knew they wouldn't, oh, how many have heard of, of re collect calls? Yeah. Those things, you could do that, call and collect, and, and then the person agrees to pay it here. And I knew where she was working, they would not accept a collect call. So I thought, I've got to wait until she gets home from work, which would be about an hour and a half. It was around 4 o'clock, the bank was closed, she'll get home at 5.30. So I went, laid the seat back, took a nap, and 5.30 I went over the pay phone, and I dialed zero, then I said, this is a collect call, gave my name on all this number, and rang and rang and rang, says, nobody's there. I didn't have answer machines back then. And he says, well, nobody's there. So I went back. 15 minutes later, I went and called again. Every 15 minutes, I called. Till 9 o'clock at night. Five hours I was there. I thought, where is she? Well, I'm guessing what she was. She worked at Broadview Academy in the cafeteria. And... Uh, she uh, has a soft heart. And I was guessing some girl had boyfriend problems or was homesick or something, and she was giving someone, you know, comforting somebody. She didn't get home until 11 o'clock that night. <laughs> so here I am, 9 o'clock, can't get over my wife. It has been nine hours since I had anything to eat, and I remembered that out by that gas station, a mile north town, was a little supermarket, and I had seen that I could use my credit card to buy food but not gas. So I thought, I'll walk out there and I'll at least get something to eat. So I went in and I got some nuts and raisins. And anybody eat nuts and raisins are kind of nice. Anyway, I got some. And I got in line to go through the checkout counter. And while I was standing there, a lady came with a shopping cart heaped with stuff. And I looked at that and I got what I thought was a good deal for her and me. So I turned to her and I said, if I, let me pay for everything in your cart with my credit card. Then you just give me $10 so I can get some gas and go home. And you know what that lady said to me? Get away from me! <laughs> I, was, I knew what she was thinking, that I'd sold the credit card and I was wanting some money so I could go get drunk. I was so embarrassed, I could feel my ears getting warm. And she pulled her, her car out of the line and went and got the farthest she could get away from me. And everybody in the store had heard, and I was so embarrassed. I went on through line, they let me buy my peanuts and my raisins, and I went out and I sat on the curb. And I was feeling so sorry for my. How many have ever been in a situation like you feel like everybody doesn't like me? Now, everybody, and I was sitting there on the curb thinking, what am I going to do? Just about then I heard a voice behind me, a man's voice, and he said, are you the guy that ran out of gas? 
who doesn't have any money. I stood up, I says, yeah, that's me sure enough. He reached in his hip pocket, he pulled out his wallet, he opened it up, he reached in, he pulled out a $10 bill and held it out to me. Now at the time, I'd been a preacher for about 13 years. I had a bachelor's degree in religion. I had a master's degree in religion. I had taken classes in worship. I would preached sermons on worship. I would conducted worship. But when that guy held out that $10 bill to me, I learned more about the true nature of worship than I'd ever learned in my life. That was the first time in my life that I ever was tempted to worship a human being. I was so grateful, it was everything I could do to keep from going down to my knees and kissing his feet. I was so desperate, and here he comes along, a perfect stranger, and he says, you got a problem, and I'm going to take care of it for you. How many know what worship is now, right? This is what God, anyway. I says, well, give me your name and address, I want to, I want to send it. No, he says, it's a gift, just take it. I stood there and argued with him until he finally gave it to me, and the guy's name is, and I hurried back down, got a can from the gas station, put the gas in the car, went home. And uh, I wasn't mad with my wife, but she came in the party for about the same time I did, about 11 o'clock. And I didn't say, where have you been? I said, you know what just happened to me? <laughs> so the next day, I went to the bank, and I got a nice, crisp $20 bill. I put it in an envelope. I put a book, Steps to Christ, in the envelope, put the guy's name and address on it, and sent it. Now, question, how much money did I owe the guy? How much? Ten. I didn't want anything. He said it was a gift. But he gave me $10. How much did I tell you I gave him back? 20. 20. Why in the world would I give a guy $20 when all I gave you was just the day before 10 and he said even that was a gift. Why did I give him $20? Gratitude. Abject gratitude. I was the wash in gratitude. And the years have gone by since that and I realized what I could have taken credit card a, a motel or whatever. But what Jesus has done for me is so much above that $20 bill. Right. And the thing that gives the Christian life strength is rejoicing. My name is in the book. How did we get our name in the book? What did Jesus do to get my name in the book? You know, he suffered and died and was crucified. And God the Father, as we sang in the song, he laid on him. All my iniquity. Not only did Jesus suffer, I am convinced that God the Father suffered too. If not as much, at least more. And I believe that Abraham was asked to do what Abraham did to say his son because God wanted a human being to understand, this is what I'm going to do for you. Now notice what it says back here in Luke 10 20. Notwithstanding this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject, but rather rejoice. Why? Your name is written in the book. Now, what does it mean to have your name written in the book? Go back to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And you, you know Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, At that time shall Michael the prince stand up and there will be a time of trouble such as there never was. How many read that one? How many read that with a little bit of fear? Well, what's the very next phrase? And they will be delivered whose names are written in the book. Am I right? Amen. And so having your name written in the book means that when Jesus comes, if your name is in the book, you're going to go. So when you're rejoicing that your name is in the book, what are you rejoicing about? I'm going to be one of the ones that's delivered. Uh, there's another text, Philippians 4.4. 4. We could have sung this one. Let's do it anyway. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. Again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, again I say rejoice. Now how many believe that's a good text? Amen. However, it tells you rejoice, but it doesn't tell you what to rejoice about. And if we were to have a testimony meeting, and you were going to be giving thanks to God, I mean, when I get done preaching, we're going to eat, and someone's going to thank God for the food. Is that something good to thank for? We thank Him for the nice day. We thank Him for our health. The brother that was prayed for to get a job, he gets a job, he thanks God for the job. And I don't want to put any of those things down. Well, even farther. You go to the doctor and he says, you've got cancer. And he says, it's uncurable. You're going to die. And you call the elders and the pastor and they anoint you and you're cured. How do you rejoice over that? Amen. But I want to tell you something. Including being cured from cancer 
It's all chicken feed. It's all chicken feed. Because if you cure the cancer, if you get a job, whatever, still you're going to die. And so, when we have testimony meetings, the most important thing that we can be giving thanks for is Jesus took his blood and wrote my name in his book. And if you look there in Philippians 4, 4, and you go back to the last few words of verse 3, it will tell you, because we've, I won't sing it again, rejoice in the Lord how often? Always. Always. Rejoice about what? Go back. I want you to open your Bibles here. Philippians 4, 3. And I want you to look at the last few words of verse 3. Just before, rejoice the Lord always again, I say rejoice. Rejoice about what? Just as soon as you find you got a good loud voice, I can hear you. Alright. Verse 3. Read the last eight words of verse 3 of Philippians 4. Alright. Whose name are written, uh, whose names are written in the book of life. And then you say, rejoice the Lord always. Rejoice the Lord about what? Jesus took his blood. He took everything I deserve. He gives me what he deserves. And he wrote my name in his book. And now when I sing that song, I say, rejoice in the Lord always. My name is in his book. Do I deserve to have my name in the book? Not a chance. I do not deserve to have my name written in the book. And uh, Sabbath school teacher asked me to come outside and he wanted to put something on his phone. I'll tell you what it was. And I've said this to some of you. But I often have people, how many ever have someone come and say, well, how are you doing? Anybody ever heard that happen? Use that as an opportunity to witness. Because when people say, how are you doing? I says, nobody here treats me the way I deserve. Oh, what's the matter? I says, nothing, that's a good thing. Because the book, Desire of Ages, says Jesus was treated the way he deserved. And I said, so unless you beat me and spit on me and drive nails in my hands, I'm not being treated the way I deserve. Right. Amen. And another one that you didn't ask me, but I'll tell you this one too. How many have ever had people say to you, God bless you? Anybody ever heard God bless you? No. Some people think i got a smart mouth. But when people say God bless you, I say thank you, God bless you too. But let me tell you what I've discovered. If God doesn't bless me, it won't be His fault. He is trying to bless me all the time. He's trying to give you eternal life, even right now. And so when we're looking here at Luke 10, 19 and 20, I'll give you power over Satan. How do you get the power? Rejoice that your name is in the book. Amen. Now let me show you a couple other places where it uses this phrase. It's found in the book of Revelation. And you know in Revelation chapter 13, it's talking about the mark of the beast. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Who will worship the beast? Who will worship the beast? whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then when you go to chapter 17, and you go to verse 8 in chapter 17, it says, And the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall send out of the bottom of the spit and go into perdition, and they that dwell upon there shall wonder, who will wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Why don't the people whose names are in the book worship the beast. Why don't the people whose names are in the book, why don't they wander after this? Why don't they do that? Because they have tapped into a source of strength. And so when Satan starts to tempt you, by the way, do you know how Satan tempts you? He starts putting thoughts in your mind. He makes you think you want something. He makes you think you want to do it. But when Satan starts putting his thoughts in your mind, you start rejoicing. My name is in the book. I know I don't deserve it. It's God's mercy that got my name in the book. Let's go to two more verses here in the book of Revelation. Uh, one of them is found in chapter 20, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. If your name's not in the book of life, you're going in the fire. Go down to the last verse of chapter 21, which is verse 27. And this is the best one of all. And there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worth abomination or make life, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So when Jesus told the disciples, and here they were still big with each other, Peter still had his heart to curse and swear. He didn't know he'd do it, but he did. And yet before that, Jesus was saying to them, Rejoice that your name is in the book. 
And I believe that had Peter been rejoicing his name in the book, he wouldn't have let Jesus down. And I believe had Judas been rejoicing that his name was in the book, he would not have prayed Jesus. Because it says here in the book of Revelation, those people who are ready for the time of trouble. In fact, as we read it in the, in the bulletin, notice down the last paragraph under that, these exercises. What exercises? Rejoicing that your name is in the book. These exercises drive back the power of Satan. They expel the spirit of murmuring and complaint. And the tempter loses ground. How many like that phrase? The tempter loses ground. How many want Satan to attack you? And then when he attacks you, you start rejoicing. My name is in the book. And he will say to you, you, what have you done to get your name in the book? You don't deserve it in the book. And you say, you're absolutely right. I don't deserve it. It was mercy. Jesus took my place. He was crucified so that I could live. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone his own way. And the Lord, the Father, has laid on him. Everything I've ever done wrong was all put on Jesus. That is the only reason that I can rejoice that my name is in the book. I had a lady come into my church. She had a smoking problem. She couldn't quit. Took her through the five-day plan. She couldn't quit. We set the five-day plan up in her house and showed it again. She still couldn't quit. So I stopped by her house a few days later, and I could tell by the look on her face when she came to the door that she knew it was the preacher, and he was going to say, well, is it working? Are you quit smoking? But I knew that she was still smoking. I could tell by the look on her face. And I believe in righteousness by faith, not by embarrassment. So I didn't talk about smoking. I said to her, her name was Pat. Pat, I don't want you to try to quit smoking anymore. How many think an Adventist preacher should be fired for telling somebody who's trying to quit smoking and quit trying? She says, what do you want me to do? I says, do you remember the first Bible study I gave you three weeks ago? She says, about my name on the book? I said, yeah. I said, Satan has stolen that hope away, hasn't he? Well, yeah, he did. I said, well, that doesn't surprise me. He's all the time, steps to Christ, and Satan is constantly seeking to steal away the blessed assurance of Jesus. So what I want you to do after this is every time that you have, are tempted to smoke a cigarette, what I want you to do is use your willpower and start thanking Jesus for having written your name in the book of life. Right. And she says, well, how can I believe my name's in the book of life if I can't quit smoking? And I said, how will you ever have the strength to quit smoking if you're not rejoicing your name is in the Lamb's book of life? I said, that's all I'm asking you to do is every time you want a cigarette, you start rejoicing. My name is in the book. Right. And when Jesus comes, he's going to take me. I said, that's all I want you to do. Will you do that? Well, yeah, she said, I can do that. She came to meetings that night. I had this terrible urge to say, is it working? But I've already told you, I don't believe in embarrassment. And she didn't tell me. She didn't say anything, and I didn't ask her. And she came to church every night. We're holding meetings. And she never said, I, oh, I want to know, is it working? But I didn't get out of her house because she was coming every night, and I was after the people that weren't coming to meetings. On the seventh night, meeting was over. She came out, shook my hand, hurried on out. And she stopped and she was talking to a lady that I knew had the same problem she did. And I heard Pat say to that lady, don't try to quit smoking anymore. She said, it won't do any good. She says, after this, every time you're tempted to smoke, use your willpower to start thanking God for writing your name in the book of life. She says, that's what I've been doing. I haven't smoked for a week and I know I'll never smoke again. Amen. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Where do you get the joy of the Lord? My name is written in the book. After David committed his sin, he writes about it in Psalms 51. Create me a clean heart, O God, renew unto me a right spirit. When you get to the end of that, it says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Then sinners will be converted unto thee. How do you win people to Jesus? Look at your bulletin one more time. To praise God, in fullness and sincere in heart, as much a duty as to pray. We're to show the world and all heavenly intelligence that we appreciate the wonderful love of God for fallen humanity, and then we're expecting larger, yet larger blessings from His infinite fullness. Expect Him to come and take me to heaven. After a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit, our joy in the Lord, our efficiency in His service, would be increased by recounting His goodness and His wonderful works on behalf of His children. These exercises... What exercises? 
rejoicing. My name is in the book. That's right up there at the paragraph at the top. These exercises drive back the power of Satan. They expel the spirit of murmuring and complaint, and the tempter loses ground. They cultivate the attributes of character which will fit the dwellers on earth for the heavenly mansions. Do you want your character to be fit for the mansions? How do you get your character fit? How do you overcome Satan? How do you give God all your thoughts? How do you resist Satan? You start rejoicing. I don't deserve it. My name is in the book. They cultivate those attributes of character which will fit the dwellers on earth for the heavenly mansions. Such a testimony will have an influence upon others. No more effective means can be employed for winning souls to Christ. Rejoicing. I read a quote in Steps to Christ that says that we lift ourselves into the presence of God on wings of praise. Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus in heaven, we know, we all of us here know, that we don't deserve to be saved. That we don't deserve to have our name in the book. But if you want to accept Jesus' invitation, as the disciples did, with all their weaknesses, all their faults, but he, you gave them an invitation, come and follow me. If you want to say what the disciples said that day, even if your weakness everything, you want to say, Jesus, I accept your invitation. I'm going to come and follow you. If we make that choice to follow Jesus, then we have every right to rejoice. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And as we're rejoicing over that, we push back the power of Satan and we receive the power that Jesus came to give us. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Amen. Amen. 216. 216. I hope you can sing this song with assurance and enthusiasm when the roll is called up yonder. Because of what Jesus did, I'll be there. Hymn number 216. Let's stand together.
Not because we're good enough, but because believing it is where we get our strength. So help us, Father, to leave this place today with our hearts filled with gratitude, perpetual gratitude, because we're able to say with full assurance, because of what Jesus did, because of the Father placed all my guilt, all my sin, all my suffering, all on Jesus, I can say with joy and certainty, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Help us, Father, to know it's believing this, it's rejoicing in this that gives us victory over Satan. It's how we put our mind on the right things. It's how we block out Satan's temptations by rejoicing. We bring ourselves into the courts of heaven. Help us to do this perpetually. Amen. Amen.